Good morning, everyone. Uh, today we'll be finishing up our discussion of Hobbes by looking at his account of political authority and the social contract in book two of Leviathan. Uh, I'm going to try to make this a little bit shorter than last, uh, uh, the, on Monday, um, some of the material that we'll talk about, but let's go ahead and get right into it. So again, uh, today we're looking at book two of Leviathan. Uh, looking at the question of the, of the social contract, question of political authority for Hobbes. Our goals today are to both explain the Hobbes' account of the social contract, how it genera generates political authority, and then in your discussion posts for today, we're, you're going to look, think about how Hobbes' theory could be applied to contemporary politics. Who is the sovereign in the United States? So, the word Leviathan itself, both the title of this book and the image that Hobbes used to describe the figure of the sovereign, uh, Hobbes is drawing on the image of the Leviathan from the book of Job in the Hebrew scriptures, chapter 41. And in, this, in the book of Job, it refers to a great sea monster. Um, the Leviathan itself is a reflection of an older Canaanite myth of Lotan, uh, a primeval monster defeated by the god Baal Hadad. Um, it parallels the role of the Mesopotamian uh, Tiamat, de defeated by Marduk, and there's this kind of constant sea monster in many, uh, many myth myths of the time period. In the context of the Book of Job itself, um, the Book of Job poses the question of theodicy, uh, which is, is God just or is God good, even though there's human suffering in the world? And, and the Leviathan here is to invoke, is invoked to show the omnipotence and wisdom of God, that no matter how great the power of Leviathan, only God can subdue it. So this Leviathan, um, of which there are no hopes of capturing it, that all the other gods are overwhelmed by it. Um, this Leviathan that is terror all around its teeth, its back is made of shields and rows. Uh, it is they're joined to one another, they clasp each other, cannot be separated. It sneezes, flash forth light, and its eyes are like the eyelids of the dawn. From its mouth go flaming torches, sparks of fire leech, leaf out. So trying to imagine this ma massive sea monster, fire-breathing, armored, impossible uh, to defeat in battle. And again, where for, for, for the Book of Job, Leviathan is showing that, like, no matter how great this sea monster is, um, the, 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 the god of Hebrew scriptures is superior and omnipotent over this Leviathan. However, for uh, Hobbes, Leviathan takes a different formation. Um, Hobbes compares Leviathan, to, uh, uses the language of Leviathan to describe the sovereign, uh, to suggest that it is a mortal god, rivaling God's absolute sovereignty over the universe with the absolute sovereign of sovereignty and absolute power of the uh, of the sovereign over over the kingdom, over the over the territory. So, if you look in your books on, uh, on in the in the, the frontispiece piece in the beginning of Leviathan that I've reproduced here, it's on X C I I I, in the introduction in, in introductory uh, sections of the book, you can see. Hobbes' theory kind of laid out in visual form. Here we have the figure of the sovereign themselves overlooking the rest of the, the rest of the realm. Uh, if you look closely, you can see here that the figure of the sovereign is made up of many small people. In the same way that in the social contract, we unite all of our wills into the singular will of the sovereign. Here, the sovereign rules and unites military or political power, with the, uh, symbolized by the sword, with ecclesiastical or church power, religious authority, as signified here with the bishop's crozier. Here we have on the left side the symbols of military power, fortresses, uh, crowns, cannons, arms, uh, battles. And here we have the symbols of ecclesiastical power, churches, bishops, mitres, um, the kind of divine judgment, uh, the weapons of the faith. Uh, these are like the different virtues here. Um, the cardinals, the bishops, the clergy, right? Uh, and so you have this unity of uh, for for Hobbes of temporal and 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 and, and religious power. Uh, all and and it's and it's made up not by one person but by all of the people uniting into one artificial person. So how do we get here? How do we get to Leviathan? How do we create, how do we get to this sea monster? 
well, for Hobbes, we have to, uh, oh yes, and if you are looking for a quarantine project to keep yourself occupied, um, this was going around the internet around Halloween time last year, um, to make your own Leviathan costume. So, so to get, how we get, think back and recall what's going on in the state of nature. So if we remember from book one, the state of nature is nothing other than the state of war. Uh, and in this state of nature, Hobbes suggests on page 117 that we only introduce restraints or laws or limits to our unlimited liberty in the state of nature in order to maintain our own lives, what he calls the foresight of their own preservation and of a more contented life thereby. Um, that, the, that we would, that we, we only would give up our unlimited liberty in the state of nature in order to maintain our lives. And we do so because the laws of nature aren't enough. With, he says, with uh, the natural passions of man, with no visible power to keep them in awe, and no fear of punishments to tie them to the performance of their covenants, without, the, the laws of nature and basic promises just aren't enough for our own security in the state of war. Um, and, and nor will groups and multitudes um, he writes on page 18, because even you living in community, we're only going to increase conflict. And so the only reason we give up the natural liberty of the state of nature is to maintain our own preservation. Now, you might be thinking back to Aristotle, where he, Aristotle says that we have a natural affinity to live in community with one another, that just like other social animals and social creatures, that we naturally want to live in community. Plato makes the same point, remember, about the lack of self-sufficiency means that we form these political communities. Um, but Hobbes offers a critique of this thinking. On the one hand, he says that, um, our, that human beings are naturally in constant competition, that our prime, that's kind of our primary motivation, that we prefer the private to the common good, that we, that human reason, our ability to, uh, our distinctive human reason, rather than creating a desire for uh, the good life as an Aristotle, for Hobbes thinks that it creates a desire for more power, um, and that this desire for power and political power is in order to secure our own well-being. He also argues that human language um, allows us to represent things in a unique way, in a way that animal language does not, and that that human language leads to conflict. Um, that human beings, when we are at ease, we get anxious and we are worried and we become, in what his words, more troublesome. But ultimately, he wants to argue, and this is the argument that he makes in this book, is that human accord and community is an artificial product. It's not a natural harmony. That left to nature, human beings would not form these political, uh, human beings would not live in peace and harmony uh, and deliberate about the good and the just, but instead that they would just fight each other. And so we have to create artificial restraints on our, uh, on our behavior. And so I put, I've reproduced this passage on page 120 and it's in full, and we're going to go through it slowly. Um, but th this is how we get to um, common power. He says that the only way to erect such a common power as may be able to defend them from the invasion of foreigners or the injuries of one another, and thereby to secure them in such sort as they, by their own industry and by the fruits of the earth, that may nourish themselves and live contentedly, is to confer all their power and strength upon one man or upon one assembly of men. That again, we have to give up our unlimited power according to the rights of nature, right? Uh, if we remember from book one, the right of nature gives us unlimited power, even the right to others' bodies in order to preserve ourselves. And we give up this power and we confer it into either one man or one assembly of men. Um, Hobbes, we'll talk a little bit later about the different um, kind of uh, models of sovereignty that Hobbes discusses, uh, but he does leave it open that you could have a sovereign that is an assembly of men, not just a king. And so in doing so, what we're doing is we're reducing all of our wills, the plurality of voices, into one will, um, that we are uniting our disparate wills and we're, we're trying to create and appoint a single person that's going to represent us. Uh, and if you're curious more about this, I suggest looking back to the discussion of authorship in the last chapter of book one of Leviathan. Um, this is the this is chapter 16. Um, it begins on page 111, in which he discusses this idea of creating a, uh, of authors and, and things authored, um, that we are basically creating an agent that speaks in our name. Uh, and so the things that uh, we basically authorize this artificial, this person to act in the name of all of us. And so their actions, they act in our name and we bear responsibility for those actions.
And so, and he, he argues that this takes place through a covenant, and this is where we get this idea of the social contract, that I authorize and give up my right of governing myself to this man or to this assembly of men on this condition, that thou might, that thou give up thy right to him and authorize all of us act, all of his actions in them, like, manner. That we are not making a contract with government for Hobbes. Um, we'll see that this is different than with Locke next week. We are making a contract with each other that we are all going to give up our mutual right and empower this other artificial so this artificial person, the sovereign, to make decisions for us that we are bound to, um, to take violence in our name um, and to in ensure for the mutual peace and security of all of us. But we are contracting with one another. We are not contracting with the sovereign. And we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail later. Um, but this contract takes place with each other and we are then uh, empowering this artificial person. You can kind of think of it along the lines of like a, almost like a, like a demonic ritual, right? That we are all kind of sacrificing a little bit of ourselves into this, into some, you know, like witch's cauldron, and then out comes this, this, you know, we summon forth this great uh, monster of Leviathan. Um, and so uh, in this in this contract, what we are doing is we're taking all of our disparate wills and we're being un and we're uniting ourselves into one person. And this is what he calls the Commonwealth um, or the Great Leviathan, uh, that mortal god to which we owe under uh, under the immortal god our peace and defense. That we are creating an immortal god, uh, or sorry, an a mortal god to uh, preserve our peace and security. And whoever has this power, whoever we empower, whether it one person or the or, or an assembly of person, those that carry that power to make the law and preserve the common defense is called the sovereign, and everyone else is the subject. Um, that we empower one person or one group of people to act in our name with sovereign authority. So what are the powers and rights that we are given giving to the sovereign? First, um, the sovereign, the form of the government cannot be changed. Um, once we have made a covenant to one sovereign, we cannot, the people cannot lawfully create a new one because this would undermine this, this unique power of the sovereign that once we give up that power to the sovereign, we can't take it back unless the sovereign no longer exists. Um, again, if we think back to what, uh, we're, what we're, uh, the context of the English civil wars, right? Um, Hobbes is saying that parliament can't do what they tried to do. It cannot try to assert more power than to claim the right of sovereignty over the monarch. Second, sovereign power cannot break the contract. There is no contract with Leviathan, therefore the sovereign cannot actually violate the social contract. Only people can, only natural persons. The sovereign can never be in violation of, of, of the social contract. All those who dissent to the social contract, right? Um, that, that, that even if you dissent, once you kind of agree that we're going to uh, come together and and and, and, choose, and and authorize a sovereign. Once you've done that, even if you uh, once you've done that, the majority takes the law rule, and you follow the majority rule. Once you've consented to join this originally assembly, so even if you say, "Oh, I wanted a democratic assembly, not a monarchy," if the majority wants the monarchy, even the democratic dissenters are bound to obey the monarch. Right? Once you have decided to f join this political community, once you've decided to join the Commonwealth, you are subject to the law, even when you disagree. There is nothing forth that the sovereign can do that would unjustly harm the subject. And this is because ultimately everything that the sovereign does, we are giving permission, at least tacitly, to the sovereign. That the sovereign has permission from us to do whatever the sovereign deems is necessary. Um, is, therefore, the, the sovereign is determining the meaning of justice. Um, it would, it would, it would be nothing, the sovereign ultimately determines what's in our own interest and therefore cannot harm, cannot violate our interests. The sovereign cannot be executed. This is just straight up from the English Civil Wars. The parliament cannot execute Charles I, Hobbes is saying. That you cannot uh, punish the sovereign for your own actions. Because remember, everything the sovereign is doing, it's doing because we've given it authority to do so. The sovereign ultimately determines religious doctrines uh, because Hobbes is concerned that debates over religion, he's writing in the context of wars over religion, that these religious disputes can lead to conflict and therefore to promote peace, the sovereign can determine the content of religious doctrines. The sovereign alone passes the laws. There's no separation of powers. There's no, uh, because a separate lawmaking power would divide authority and make sovereignty weaker. 
the sovereign also holds supreme judicial authority um, because if you are there's if there's a separate independent judiciary determining the meaning of laws or fact that can lead to civil war again there can be no power that can check the unlimited power of the sovereign the sovereign alone can go to war only the sovereign can declare war and the sovereign is necessarily the head of the military so appoints all states ministers and public officials that the sovereign has to be able to enforce and execute the law here so as you can see the sovereign has the legislative authority judicial authority and executive authority finally the sovereign grants all titles of honor and rank this creates a sense of order in the commonwealth that only the sovereign can say like you are now a duke or a lord or a, or, or, or a duchess and so ultimately then the question then is where does political authority come from where um and for hobbes political authority comes from the people however once we have authorized the sovereign anything the sovereign does is legitimate anything the sovereign does makes the rules so while the authority comes from the people the sovereign then has the ability ha, once the sovereign has this authority the sovereign cannot violate the social contract and cannot undermine the people's uh and cannot act illegitimately um unless the sovereign is failing to maintain peace and security as we'll talk about in a second and so a question for you to think about is on this question of consent are the people really consenting to this when and they're choosing out of fear So, furthermore, the powers, someone might suggest, and this is where this question of consent really matters, uh, is that someone might object that this is bad. And this is in the objection that Hobbes raises on page 128. So if we turn there in the blue book, he says, but a man here may object that the condition of subjects is so very miserable as being obnoxious to the lusts and other irregular passions of him that they or, or them that have so unlimited a power in their hands and commonly they live under a monarch and think it the fault of the monarchy or live under a government of democracy or other sovereign assembly attribute it all the inconveniences to that form of commonwealth whereas power in all forms if they be perfect enough to protect them is the same and so hobbes is saying that you might think that this is awful but you have to compare it to the state of nature that no matter how inconvenient the form of government that you have is, if it's providing for peace, it's always it's going to be better than the state of nature, that nothing is worse than the constant fear of a violent death. And so Hobbes is saying that, look, to receive any benefits of security and peace and certainty, there's going to be have to, have to be trade-offs, and some of those trade-offs means we have to give up our unlimited rights. And it's only our passions and our self-love that make it hard for us to recognize the value of this trade-off. If that we were all acting rationally and doing this kind of rational calculation that Hobbes describes in book one as the true nature of human reason, then we would recognize that this is the right and easy choice. Now we're going to talk about the forms of sovereignty and what Hobbes thinks of as liberty in just a second, but if you need to pause this video, take a break, come back to it later, this is a great time to do so. All right, so in chapter 19, Hobbes discusses different forms of sovereignty. I'm not going to spend a long time discussing this here, um, but Hobbes is basically saying that we can break up different forms of government, different forms of sovereignty, in two questions. The first question is, who is the sovereign? So if we have one person as a sovereign, we have a monarchy. Or if we have many people, we have an aristocracy or a democracy. You'll notice that we're kind of following the same thing that we saw in Aristotle, monarchy, aristocracy, democracy. Um, but he says that things like tyranny, oligarchy, anarchy, uh, all of these like negative or corrupt forms of these regimes are just silly names. If we think back to his kind of emphasis on um, clarity of language in book one, he's saying that these are just names that we give to, we call a, a monarch that we don't like a tyrant. We call a democracy that we don't like an anarchy. We call it an aristocracy we don't like an oligarchy. Hobbes prefers a monarchy to a democracy or aristocracy. Um, he's thinking that, um, the, that the expediency of the monarchy, the monarchy is able to act more efficiently and faster. The monarchy is also united in a single person, so they're not plagued by collective action problems that a democracy or an aristocracy or any other group of people will be plagued by. 
but his account isn't necessarily anti-democratic um, in the sense that he says that you can have a democratic sovereign. Um, it is still going to be absolutist. It's not going to be Republican in the sense that there are certain rights preserved to the people uh, or that there are certain institutional checks on the unlimited authority. If the, Demo Demo if the Democratic Assembly is the sovereign, right, they have absolute authority. They can pass whatever law they want. So the other thing to think about is where did the sovereign come from? On the one hand, we might have a sovereignty by institution, and this is a sovereign constructed through the social contract that we just talked about. And that's the kind of like the one that Hobbes spends the most time discussing in book two. But you can also have um, sovereignty by succession, um, that when the sovereign dies, whoever is the heir to the sovereign, especially in a monarchy or in a small aristocratic assembly, who succeeds the uh, the sovereign, right? And this is a really big challenge for him, uh, as, as Hobbes discusses on page 135 of the book, uh, because the sovereign is supposed to have an artificial immortality, an earthly immortality. And so there has to be a clear line of succession for Hobbes so that the so sovereignty is preserved across generations. You can also have uh, sovereignty by acquisition or conquest. And he said, and here he calls this despotical or dom or dominion. Uh, and, 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 the, and on page 141, and he's saying that like, look, if you conquer another nation, you have authority. But it's not for Hobbes, and this is crucial, because you are victorious, but because the people consent to your rule. The people always have the option to not consent to your rule when you conquer them. Um, they could always keep fighting until you kill them all, is Hobbes' basic answer. And so ultimately what Hobbes is saying is that when the people put down their arms and they're consenting, and that's what generates that authority. So it actually ends up kind of being a form of the social contract that once you um, acquire this uh, succession here, that this rel ultimately relies on a form of individual consent. That for Hobbes, it is always the question of consent, but it's a very particular model of consent that Hobbes is talking about. So what rights do individuals in the sovereign have? Hobbes, now remember, everyone who's not the sovereign is a subject. So what rights do the subjects have? Now Hobbes defines liberty as, quote, the absence of opposition. Liberty for him is not a conception based on internal like the choice or decision making. It's about not having some sort of external or physical impediment that is going to limit us. Uh, and this liberty is only attached to physical bodies. It's not attached, it's, liberty can't describe something like a will or thought or soul. So freedom of thought or freedom of the will or freedom of the soul is not really anything meaningful for him. And so what he's saying here is, he's, why would we define liberty in this way? Um, he's trying to show that it is consistent with both fear and necessity. That when we are afraid or when we are being, uh, feel that we are, don't have free will over something, that we still have liberty as long as we are not literally being like chained to do something. So when we are afraid for our lives, it is still, we are still at liberty to consent to forming Leviathan. And therefore, the, um, breaking with this classical conception of liberty as kind of rational self-determination, this kind of like platonic ideal of like ordering your soul such that the rational part of the soul is, in, is ruling with the help of this, your spirit at will over your appetites, or Aristotle's kind of cultivation of virtue as a form of freedom. For Hobbes, it's literally just the, um, that there is nothing uh, nothing constraining your physical movement and therefore it is entirely consistent with absolutist government because you still have liberty to move you can still move out um even though you are restricted by even though the government has absolute power you don't have any political rights so there are certain rights that are retained even while uh, hobbes rejects this freedom of as self-determination he says that we are at liberty and in, quote, these things which in re regulating their actions, the sovereign hath permitted. So the sovereign creates, um, the political liberty exists in these spaces where the sovereign has not ruled or has created, um, where the sovereign basically has said, you can do what you want here. Um, these things in which regulating their actions, the sovereign hath permitted. And so more specifically, we are, have the right not to kill or maim uh, oneself. We cannot be compelled to kill ourselves because that would be 
undermining the entire point of the social contract, right? The, the sovereign cannot compel us to kill ourselves because we would not have joined, we would not have left the state of nature otherwise. Uh, similarly, we cannot self-incriminate ourselves in the same re for the same reason. We also have the right to resist conscription. Um, we have the right to, and when the sovereign is saying that we have to go to war, we can resist this is this punishment. And we have liberty in the cases where the law remains silent. And that's the phrase he uses on page 152. That where the law is silent, we have liberty. And so ultimately what Hobbes is kind of saying here is that we can always resist the sovereign if the sovereign is threatening us with violent coercive force. But the sovereign would always be justified in killing us for resisting the law. So there's a kind of delicate balance here for Hobbes that the, the sovereignty all kind of comes back and looks a little bit like Thrasymachus and Ma or, or kind of Machiavellian might equals right here. That because if the sovereign isn't able to actually enforce the laws, for him, we don't have a sovereign anymore. So if there were enough people able to rally around together and resist the sovereign and win, like fight back in a civil war, for Hobbes, that's a sign that that sovereign really wasn't sovereign. Because he also goes on on page 153 and 154 to suggest that if the sovereign dies or if the sovereign is not able to kind of be sovereign, then we return to the natural liberty of nature and we can do whatever we want, including set up a new sovereign, that we return, those powers are returned to us. And so here, again, there's this delicate balance that Hobbes is kind of saying, like, you have, sovereignty is like this binary state. You either are or aren't, and you don't know if you no longer are sovereign until, you, uh, until it's, that power is tested. In the same way that Thrasymachus tries to get out of Plato's or Socrates' kind of uh, rhetorical techniques by saying, like, well, look, if the, if, the, if the ruler is making decisions that harm themselves, and they're not, clearly not the stronger, that they're not the ruler. And if the sovereign here is not able to enforce the law, is not able to mobilize an army, is not able to get put down a rebellion, then that sovereign wasn't really a sovereign. That sovereign wasn't able to maintain peace, and you actually are still in the state of war. So next class, we're going to still think of, be thinking in the social contract tradition, but we're turning to John Locke's, uh, all, uh, who's writing a, you know, a good close to a century later uh, in the two treatises on government. And he gives us a very different picture of both the state of nature and sovereignty, even though he starts from very similar premises to Hobbes. Um, so I'm asking you to read chapters one through five of the second treatise, not the first treatise. Um, if you are interested, chapter, you should also read chapter six. Now, the discussion thread for, this, uh, for today's topic is you can answer one of these two questions. First, how do you think Hobbes would evaluate the United States? Do we have a true sovereign? If not, do we live in a state of war? And if we do have a sovereign, who is it? Is it the president? It is, is it Congress? Or do you think Hobbes is right that the only way to escape a constant fear of violence and war is to give up our liberty to an absolutist sovereign? Or is there some other way? Now, as a reminder, um, everyone must post one 200 word post to either of these discussion questions by Friday at midnight. And everyone has to reply to at least one peer's post with a 100 word reply by Sunday at midnight. So uh, thank you for tuning in to today's lecture and my computer's kind of freezing up here. To, uh, but I hope that this was uh, helpful for you. I hope that this was illuminating. Again, if you have any questions, we'll have a discussion section on Wednesday evening. And I am also available in office hours. So uh, thanks for tuning in, and I will see you next week.